Speaksies. Follow Jonathan's uh, advice. He said, the government wants to tweak your beard and punch you in, in the chest to get you violent. That way they got you. What the government can handle, the two things is nonviolence and humor. Nonviolence works. You get violent and all of a yeah. sudden things change. We saw that. If you, if you get violent, it's stupid. I feel like that I put too much faith into technology. Yeah. That there are just certain things that I expect them to work regardless of situation or. I mean, I just totally trust it. Yeah. Like I have my complete faith. And I tell you, the one that's really stood out to me is my mute button on my phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that I expect that it works, and I expect that it works with lightning speed. And I have a feeling I'm not the only person. I think that's one of the things that's come from working at home is you got to know, first of all, you're always on mute. And I think that's why one of the phrases of the year was known as you're pro if you're speaking, you're on mute or mm -hmm, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's good because... I know that there's been there's been incidents um, that could be, I don't say work ending, but de definitely image tarnishing um, if I had not had that mute button on. Well, I can't believe you're bringing this up because just earlier today, I was on like a two hour phone call oh. and I really had to use the bathroom. And, mm -hmm. and I'm like, do I, what do I say? Like, what do I do? Because right. it's just me and me and one other person. So it's right. not like I can just, it's a back and forth conversation. And I'm like, I could say... I, I need a bathroom break. I'll get back. I probably should have. Right. But instead I trusted the mute button and I just, and I really was like, I'd be like mute. I'd be like unmute. Uh-huh. Mute. Sit right. down. Go to the bathroom. Unmute. Right. Mute. Wash hands. Right. You know, yeah, that's true. Mute. Flush the toilet. And, and I really did go, if this mute button isn't working, like I think it is, right. this is the most embarrassing moment of my life. So that would you know, be a good. I hope don't. I don't encourage anyone, yeah. but that would be a brilliant like virus or thing to put <laughs> to make everyone's like mute button look like it's working right. on their phone. Mister Glissman, we will make your mute button work again if you wire two hundred thousand dollars to an account. I'd be like done. Yeah. So speaking of technology, yeah. Tonight we're going to talk about the term Big Brother. So when I hear the term big brother. It's like one of those ones. I don't know when I first heard it, it's mm -hmm. always kind of been around. I sort of knew where it came from, but if you Google big brother now, or if you bring up big brother now, you're probably going to get something about a TV show. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a reality show called big brother. It started right. in the UK in 2000 and also came over to the, the U S and I will admit that I have watched I think every season, which I don't know what that says about me. I was thinking about this. I don't know how you are. We've talked a little bit with reality shows. You right. like some of the cooking shows and things. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, any favorites right now? I'd say my favorite is actually nailed it. Okay. Um, which I've watched all the U S ones. And mm -hmm. if you haven't seen it, it's a show where people are basically brought on that. They, people understand they're not going to do a good job of baking, <laughs> but it's done in almost a nice way. Like everyone's kind of in on the joke. Um, that also has expanded to the international market. So I've started oh. watching the French and German versions too, which are interesting in their own way. Right. Um, but not making this about me, but I, yeah, I those no, are I'm my curious. favorite sort of reality well, shows. Well, the, um, I get it. So nailed it is sort of the sarcastic, like mm -hmm. nailed it, but, but it's actually not good. That sounds interesting. I, I but I got sucked into these uh, types of shows because there's something, you know, it's, it's fun to watch, you know, go to the zoo and watch animals, but you know, what's yeah. even more fun is just watching kind of people for right. me, survivor, big brother, back when the real world first came out, there was something really intoxicating about just sitting there. You know, it's almost like you're just eavesdropping on people's gossip and personal issues. Right. And there's something, I'm not saying it's healthy, um, but it's, but it's good. So big brother, uh, big brother is watching the powers that be are watching. Right. Um, I, I don't think I ever really use this phrase in my in my daily life. Mm -hmm. um, I don't sit around and just say, hey, Big Brother's watching. But but I think it's a valuable term, and I'll talk about why in a little bit. So I looked it up online. Um, the definition from edamonline.com is ubiquitous and repressive, but apparently benevolent authority. Um, in modern culture, the term Big Brother has entered the lexicon as a synonym for abuse of government power, particularly in respect to civil liberties, 
often specifically related to mass surveillance. Mm-hmm. And to that end, we are going to be speaking to John W. Whitehead in this show. And he's written a book called Battlefield America and has also written some articles about the, sort of the surveillance that we're under now. Right. And I think that's why I thought Big Brother would be a timely yeah, a timely one. So um, looking forward to talking to him and asking him some questions as he is an expert. He's a he's a constitutional attorney and the head of the Rutherford group uh, that's actually based here in Virginia as well. So where did it come from? Well, Steve, I'm so happy to say that for once we have a very straightforward answer to this question. Good. And I'm sure you know the term Big Brother comes from the 1949 novel 1984 mm-hmm. by George Orwell. So 1984, it's a it's a dystopian social science fiction novel. It calls out the dangers and consequences of totalitarianism um, and mass surveillance, among among much other things. You know, I was going to sit here and say, so I just read the whole book, mm-hmm. um, but that would be a lie. I got I had never read it. I got the book, the paperback, a few days ago, and I've read about half of it. And I was going to just pass it off as if I had read the whole thing. And I realized that Orwell would be so not proud of me because yeah. truth matters. That's one thing you find in this book is is how much we sort of lie to ourselves sometimes yeah. with with there's the truth and then there's what we want to put out there. Or there's what, you know, maybe the government wants to put out there. Right. And so there are some terms that address that that, that we'll get to. But, but man, this book really is alive if mm-hmm. you if you. Have you ever read it or you read excerpts? I, ha- I have read it, mm-hmm. and it's been a few years, um, and I kind of was reacquainting myself with it today. And something that whenever I come back to this book, and also Animal Farm, which I think is a mm-hmm. great companion, um, is just the, the way that terms from the book are so integrated and ubiquitous in our society and used all the time. And um, it's just something that, you know, he was very, it was very prophetic in a way. Yeah. Um, it's always, it's also interesting to me that this is some a book too, that um, every few years when the presidency will change parties, yeah. that uh, the party on the way out will suddenly yeah. embrace yeah. 1984. <laughs> and, you know, the new person is basically Big Brother. And it yeah. seems just kind of, there's a baton that's passed from, from winner to loser yeah. um, when that happens. But I think it's a book that just is, it's, it's so ingrained in our culture that I imagine was that for, what was your experience reading that finally for the first time? Reading it for the first time. I will tell you, it was like, I I was really surprised because sometimes you read, I mean, this is from 1949 and it feels like Orwell is looking at you, talking to you, Mm -hmm. not like in a first person, but like he's making these points through his, through, Mm -hmm. through metaphor and allegory and stuff. He's making these points and it's like, Oh my gosh, you're you're calling me out for this thing. That's how I felt when I was reading it. Not calling yeah. me a person, but us as a society as well. Right. So I didn't want this to be just like a book report on 1984, which it almost turned into. Mm-hmm. What I'll say is I also think Aldous Huxley's uh, Brave New World is another right. one. And that's an even quicker read. Mm-hmm. And it, it it's another one that just feels like, holy crap, man. You have really captured some themes here that are just as relevant mm-hmm. today. You, you know, you mentioned when political parties flip, all of a sudden the other side is, is you know, Orwellian. And we'll right. talk about that term. Um, I kind of, it's annoying in some ways. I kind of think it's good though, right? Mm-hmm. We should be vigilant about this stuff. Right. Um, but, and this is what I want to, this is one of the things I want to talk to Mr. Whitehead about is there's the government side of it. And then there's the corporate side of it uh, as far as just technology and right. how much of our privacy are we willing to uh, give up in mm-hmm. the name of profit, in the name right. of security, whatever it might be, what's really driving that? Can we slow it down? And that's mm-hmm. really not the point of this conversation, but mm-hmm. it's it, it's something we need to be thinking about. You, Everyone should have to read 1984 yeah, once every couple should. of years. And I think what's interesting to me also is, is how – we as a society, myself included, have started voluntarily yes. doing, make, taking actions that give up um, our right to privacy. The fact that my phone, if I say a certain word, will wake up means that I have purchased a listening device yes. voluntarily, enabled yeah. it to do that, and are you know contributing to the rise of Big Brother one way or the other. Yeah, and, and we... I think what we do is we sort of make jokes about it and we rationalize it. It's like, cause we're, what are you going to do? It's hard to, and again, going 
back to 1984, are you as one person going to stand up and fight against it? And that's something else I want to ask mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Whitehead is what does he think about what are some things you can do mm -hmm. to to fight against it? Because you make jokes like, for example, uh, there's like a meme about you'll see like a text conversation and it'll be like, oh, my FBI guy said this. Yeah. Right. So we're making light of it. Mm -hmm. But well, we'll talk about that more yeah. later. So where did the term come from? So we said 1984, and most believe that Orwell sort of modeled the authoritarian government in, 1980, in 1984 after Stalinist Russia. Mm -hmm. So more broadly, I think the novel really examines the role of truth, as I said earlier, which is why I'm going to say what happened, which is I read about half the book, didn't get through the whole thing. Um, the, the role of truth and facts within politics and the way in which they're manipulated. So Orwell actually worked in the government in England in the Ministry of Defense, I believe. So he had a really personal connection to this. He did not like the fact that sometimes he would have to spin things for the public when he would write, when he would, um, or he would write something and it would get manipulated a little bit. And he felt very strongly that this should not be happening. The, the people need to get the truth. And that's a huge debate. I mean, that's a whole nother podcast um, about what does the responsibility, what is the responsibility of the government? Uh, and what do they tell you? I mean, aliens, right? Like there's this whole debate about like, should we know if there are aliens right. here? Uh, but, but I'm getting way off topic. So let's pull back to um, big brother. So, as um, as you read the book, like I said before, you just see so many concepts, words, phrases that are in the culture, and we're going to get to those. Um, I don't think you can overstate how influential this book is. As I said, it feels very alive and relevant in 2021. Um, again, which is crazy. It was written 70 years ago. Um, and it's like, like I said, it feels like Orwell's really directly talking to the reader and it, it, it sort of warning them. Um, so let's let's talk about the character of Big Brother. So in the novel, Big Brother is the fictional personification of the party. Mm -hmm. So the main character in 1984, well, I, I should say the protagonist, is a guy by the name of Winston Smith, which is interesting. Every sort of name in this book means something, which I love. I love stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So Winston uh, taken from Winston Churchill, probably. Uh, Winston lives in a fictional region called Oceania, which is essentially the West, you know, America mm -hmm. and then England. The other two superpowers in the book are Eurasia and East Asia, which are kind of regions which are what they sound like. Mm -hmm. Winston lives in London and he works for the Ministry of Truth, which is, you know, exactly kind of the opposite or they're going to tell you what the truth is. Right. So he's a writer. Again, there are some similarities to Orwell's actual role in life. Mm -hmm. um, so in the, in the novel, big brother is this um, entity that is a personification of the party and, and big brother is always watching, watching through what they call telescreens. And there, there are people watching all the time. There's people snitching on you and all of this can sort of be called big brother. But during the course of the book, you know, it starts right off. You're just paranoid because for Winston, because mm -hmm. he's, he's like, he doesn't even want to have a certain look on his face. Right. You know, he does, he knows that any word he says he's done mm -hmm. um, because it's also this culture in the book of big brother sees everything. Right. And you're going to get busted. If you, if you have a thought crime, right. right. Which is a term that comes out of here. There's the thought police mm -hmm. that, I mean, this is all relevant. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and I'm going to, I'm going to just stick to the book and not, editorialize too much, but, but just it, it all sort of fits. So right. big brother is, uh, has the, the, when he's on the telescreen or in posters, it's a man, a stern looking man with a mustache in his mid forties. Um, you've probably seen the pictures. It, it differs a little bit depending on, um, a movie adaptation or whatever you see, mm -hmm. but it's all party propaganda with this face of big brother. It's kind of like not to compare it, I guess, but here goes, um, uncle Sam, Mm -hmm. You know, is Uncle Sam a real person? Right. No. But you take that to the extreme and Big Brother is like the Uncle Sam of this party to the point right. where people actually wonder, is this a real person? Mm -hmm. In fact, Winston, uh, at a certain point, spoiler alert, this is a 70-year-old book, but mm -hmm. he speaks to this uh, guy, O'Brien, who is is arresting him and he's, he asks him, hey, is is it a real person? Is he a real person? And he, and, and O'Brien's like, no. 
uh, he basically is like, well, you know, he, he is a little bit of double speak there, which mm-hmm. is another term that came from this book. Uh, but essentially you find out, no, it's not a real person. And he, cause he says he never dies. He lives forever. So where did Orwell get the name big brother? Now that's one. Now we know, we know big brother came from the book. Where did Orwell get the name? So Anthony Burgess, you probably recognize that name, mm-hmm. Steve. Clockwork Orange. That's right. He wrote, among other things, a Clockwork Orange. He also, and I did not know this, he wrote a book called 1985, ah. which was a tribute to 1984. And it sort of, it's not, it's not a sequel, but mm-hmm. so he has a theory uh, for where Big Brother came from. And I was not prepared for the creepiness of this. Uh, Steve, I will, uh, Steve runs our social media and I'm going to, mm. I very rarely do I make a formal request for a picture to be put out on our Instagram, okay. but I will with this. All right. So th- back in, uh, the forties, there was a company called Bennett's mm-hmm. and Bennett's was a, uh, correspondence school, okay. um, where you could, you know, mail out and get uh, courses mailed to you. Mm-hmm. And it's essentially like the Strayer University of or University of Phoenix of okay. 1940, 49 or 40, okay. whatever. And as part of the advertising, whether it's in newspapers or in billboards, and according to Burgess, Orwell saw these billboards. And what they said was it's it, it had sort of a benevolent old grandfatherly man. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it has his picture in it says, you know, something about you should go do this correspondence school, you know, whatever. But then the big quote says, let me be your father, Mm -hmm. which is creepy. Yeah. But even worse was when the elder Bennett retired, his son took over and the son's face began appearing on the billboards. And the son had a little more of a stern face. Right. And he, and the big quote was, let me be your big brother. Okay. Um, Which takes it even more. I mean, let me be your father. Mm-hmm. is probably technically more creepy, but if it's yeah. paired with like a, a kind of old man that looks nice, not yeah. creepy, but then you get kind of a, a, a creepy looking guy, let me be your big brother. Yeah, it, it, It's pretty weird. Maybe in the same way that this was uh, the precursor to University of Phoenix, that this was the precursor to whatever like sugar daddy websites <laughs> are out there. Just yeah. a thought. <laughs> let me be your father. Um, so that very well may be where he got it from. Um, like I said, I looked up the ads, I actually found them uh, and uh, they're, they're, they're weird. Another theory, and it's probably a mashup of both of these, is that the inspiration for Big Brother was a guy named Brendan Backen, the minister. Okay, so I said minister of defense. This makes more sense. Orwell worked for the minister of information. My bad. And it was a government department in wartime UK until 1945. So Orwell worked under this guy Bracken on the BBC's Indian service. Frankly, I don't know what that is, but mm-hmm. uh, Bracken was referred to by his employees, by his initials, BB. Mm. And as we know, in 1984, um, they would refer to Big Brother as BB. They would chant BB very, very weirdly. Um, so again, it, it may be that the two of these had to do with it. Either way, Big Brother came out of it. Um, and one thing is for sure that Orwell really resented the wartime censorship mm-hmm. and uh, the fact that things were being manipulated, uh, which is what, you know, launched his idea to write uh, 1984. So that's Big Brother. There's not much more of an explanation. I think you get it. There are some other words and phrases from the book, a lot actually, that have entered the lexicon. So the first one is just Orwellian. Mm-hmm. Um, what have you, is that one you use or fam, are you familiar with? I think so. And I think it, it is kind of connotates, gives a very good feeling of this whole police state of being surveyed. And I yeah. think as technology increases, um, it's more and more relevant. You know, the fact that this was seen as relevant back in a time where you weren't, I mean, to, to be surveyed in the, in the forties and fifties, I'd imagine was quite an undertaking yeah. And again, we've, as we were mentioning earlier, we've kind of walked into a situation where we make it a lot easier for people to, if we wanted to be tracked or surveyed. And I think of like the Chinese social credit system mm-hmm. that they have there, which is just the weaponization of that. And I think there's always that, that thought with the things to be Orwellian, you'll see big yeah. brother, you know, something happens, people will go down the slippery slope, but we've seen the slippery slope is not imagined. It's happening. You yeah. know, the, the infrastructure has been built for it and it's being used by China right now. Absolutely. 
And, and I was also thinking with the term Orwellian, just how prescient uh, you have to be as a writer in 1949 to have a adjective named after you or descriptor of Orwellian. I mean, it just goes to show because how many, how many uh, writers from that time frame, especially like this is science fiction to an extent, it's social mm-hmm. science fiction. How many things were written that really just don't really ring true? Like, I'm not saying I'm just not picking on like HG Wells cause he's right. great too, but it's, I don't, if it, someone made a time machine today, yeah. they wouldn't be sitting in a, uh, a, a yeah. lawnmower with a big wheel behind. That's it. right. It's not like the world of tomorrow, uh, yeah. from, but with Orwellian. And I was trying to think just right now off the top of my head, what are, what other authors get that treatment? I, you hear like Faustian, like a Faustian deal, like a deal with the devil. I'm trying to think of other authors. I mean, there really aren't that many. I mean, a Shakespearean tragedy, mm-hmm. of course, uh, things like that. So Orwellian, we say, I said double think before, mm-hmm. and I really liked this one because it really is a term that, you know, believing one thing in your in your mind, knowing the truth, but then saying something else or like allowing yourself to believe what you're also being told, mm-hmm. right? So it's sort of like when you're gaslit, we went over gaslit yeah. in one episode, you know that you know, you turned the light off earlier, mm-hmm. but you also kind of are convincing yourself that the person telling you that you didn't is also true. So you have right. two things going in your head and that can really mess you up. And that's kind of how I said, I wouldn't editorialize too much, but it's like getting a narrative from the media right. versus like what your own reasoning tells you and your own right. observations tell you. So double think is good. And that's also related to two plus two equals five, mm-hmm. which is a term I've actually heard a lot somewhat recently and with the idea that it means the uh, the end result is more than the sum of greater than the sum of its parts. You're going to combine two things and you're going to get synergy. That's right. the buzzword that kind of got killed a while back. Uh, but in the book, two plus two equals five actually means, Hey, if we, the state say two plus two equals five. Yeah. So if we, the media say two plus two equals five, yeah, that is what you must believe. And if you say anything else, that's a, thought crime yeah. and the thought police on Twitter are going to yeah. arrest you and cancel you. Yeah. And that, as you've been, every word that you've said, all I can think of is Twitter. It comes yeah. back to so often. And by the way, please follow us on Twitter <laughs> yeah. at, at Speaksies. Um, but I think the rise of Twitter in the last few years and just, again, the la- the ratio of good things versus bad things have come out for that. But I think it's helped enable the rise of the thought police and just really the idea of thought crimes of if you use the wrong word or the wrong phrase, or you don't give in to double think, I won't get into examples of that, but you know, there are, you are told two plus two equals five. And if you don't agree with that, you're some sort of ist, you know, there's some sort of thing and the mob will come after you. It's really scary, and yeah. and I think the reason why everyone should read 1984 again or read it for the first time is that Orwell hated communism. I mean, he mm-hmm. was a democratic socialist, which meant right. I, I don't actually even know what that meant. Then, no one does. Or what it meant. Yeah. <laughs> right. But what I do know is he he was against totalitarianism. He was mm-hmm. against fascism, which is the term that everyone gets called uh, right. at some point. Uh, well, you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, so the the parties and the leaders get called that. Um, but if this resonate, if this book resonates so well right now, mm-hmm. that's scary. Should be yeah. scary. So, Steve, the last thing uh, before we take a break here, mm-hmm. I want to mention is when I was looking at the term Orwellian, they brought up uh, whatever I was looking on. I think it was Wikipedia was uh, had mentioned that Orwellian themes are often, and I don't know why they brought this up, but Orwellian themes are often brought up when jokes that fall under the category of Russian reversals. Come Russian up. reverse. I had never heard of it. It does sound sort of like a WWF move or something, but right. are you familiar with the, the Russian reversal? Have you heard of this? I have heard of this and it makes me think of, uh, one of the, uh, I guess more famous or infamous, uh, Russian immigrants to the United States, Yakov Smirnov. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he had his whole shtick, which was the, you know, how, hey, I'm in America. I love I love America. Mm-hmm. I love this country, right? Da, da, da. And the Russian reversal, let me give you an example. Please. It, it's, here's one. In America, you brand cattle. In Soviet Russia, cattle brand you. Oh. In America, you record podcast. In Soviet Russia, 
podcast record you. So that's my, my Russian accent. Man, if, that's my Yakov Smirnov. If something ever happens to him in Branson, we can pull his debut that's, over there and you can take over for him. Yeah, Yakov Smirnov set up in Branson like 20 years ago or something. And is, is, I'm sure he's rich. Or he's he's Branson rich. Which, yeah. Yeah. Um, which, quick note to self, we should uh, look at what we could. Maybe we can go to Branson and set up shop there as well. I like it. Uh, but I, I find those, I mean, they're technically not that funny, but... They were kind of funny at the time because, yeah. and the reason that they read that there was even the joke about it was, hey, America is the land of you know opportunity and free. We don't want to be like Soviet Russia, right? So, and that's also what George Orwell thought. So, we got a little bit more to talk about with this, and then we're going to speak with our guest. But first, we are going to do a new segment called Name That Little. So I am very excited about this new segment. Yeah, me too. Name that little. So you actually, Scott, planted the seed for this a while back. You had Uh mentioned that there are many, many artists, rap artists, that have Uh the name Lil in their title. Yes. Including, or to the point that I researched what you had said, and you can find it all over the internet, so you know it must be true. As of Mm -hmm. 2018, there were over 8,000 artists. Wow. With Lil in their name. Wow. So this fascinates me to no end. Yeah. Um, and just the the kind of the origin of it also does too. So I, I believe the, the first one was Lil Bow Wow. Yeah, that's the first one I ever yeah, heard. Yeah, I remember that. And he outgrew the name. And now he just mm-hmm. goes by Bow Wow. So that <laughs> right. you know, that worked out well for him. There was Lil John that mm-hmm. I vaguely remember. I may remember him more from uh, Dave Chappelle sketches. Yes. But the one that really, really stuck with me is Lil Wayne. And I yes. think he's like the proto Lil. Like he's mm-hmm. the little yeah. from where over 8,000 have blossomed from. Yeah. Um, and you'll see this as I did. I've done way too much research on performers who begin with Lil. Um, some common things you'll see that come from Lil Wayne. Lots and lots of tattoos. Yes. And not just on their body. The whole, I think he was a pioneer with the face tattoo. Yep. Um, drama with the law. We'll put it mildly. There'll be some guns. Mm-hmm. There'll be some other things. And drugs. Lots of drugs. Lots of drugs. Uh, not yeah. just drugs. Uh, would, I expect if you're a popular musician or you're touring, mm-hmm. there's going to be some drugs. But Lil Wayne isn't really, doesn't come across me as someone who's Lil with that. Right. Which also reminds me of one of my favorite things ever written about Lil Wayne. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually a video from the onion.com DEA recruits Lil Wayne to use up all the drugs in Mexico. <laughs> it's a good strategy. Yeah. So before we get on to the Lil of the day, yeah. um, I did come across this Bon Mott on Lil Wayne's Wikipedia page, which I, I felt remiss if I did not share with you. So it discusses a uh, copyright infringement issue he had. Um, with the company that owns the publishing rights for the Rolling Stones. Hmm. So apparently he had taken something or was accused of taking something from a Rolling Stone song called Play With Fire. Mm-hmm. I don't know that off the top of my head, but I will quote directly from Wikipedia here. Subsequently, Playing With Fire was removed from the track list of all THA Carter Three. I think that's how you pronounce that album. On all Nailed it. On all online stores and replaced with a David Banner-produced track, Pussy Monster. <laughs> Pussy Monster. That's good. By the way, you mentioned Nailed It. Yeah. Um, I mentioned there's other versions of it. Yeah. And so the German version of it is entitled <gasps> Rurkan Durkan, <laughs> which means who can... Rurkan Durkan. <laughs> who can, can. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. So... Right. Anyway, if you that's have, good. I do like that. You yeah. know how much I like the German pronunciation or so, the German translation. That's good. Back to the Lil Wayne. Yeah. Hand. Yeah. So Hergen Bergen. Again, we agree that Lil Wayne is the proto. I agree. Well, proto because little. I think he's the proto Lil because mm-hmm. to your point, I don't th- even the Lil um, Lil John is a Lil. Mm-hmm. I almost don't count him. I, mean, I count him because he's a Lil, but yeah. Lil John is a take on Little John from you know Robin right. Hood. So right. it's kind of like. It's it, to be a real Lil. It's it's the Lil is like a big part. Of, like you just take a word and a name and you right. just stick Lil in front of it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it, it's, it's, I don't know. There's too much like tied to a real character with little John and Lil Bow Wow to your point outgrew it and got like six foot five and it didn't make yeah. any sense. But Lil Wayne is like a fully grown dude ripped up and, and he's a man, but he's sticking with Lil Wayne and it's just, you don't yeah. even think of the, it's just Lil Wayne. So I agree. Yeah. Everyone else has to, but here's the bad thing. Yeah. Those might be the only Lil's I know. The, well, I, well so we're about to find 7, out. 7,997 left. So the point of this segment is I'm going to give you a description of a Lil. Okay. And after I give you some information at the end, I will give you three choices to pick from. Love it. And what's also great about this segment is I think it's almost good for you not to get it right. You have incentive of anything. <laughs> right, right. I will lose respect for you if you get this okay. correct. All right. Fair enough. So it's and time. I have not studied. I really I have no idea. So it's d- now time for Scott to see if he can name that Lil. Yeah. So some background. Big surprise. This Lil is a rapper. Okay. <laughs> per Wikipedia, <laughs> this is from Wikipedia, he is known for his, quote, minimalistic music and hyperactive public persona where he is often portrayed taking s- drugs such as marijuana, lean, and Xanax. Oh, no. Actions which have garnered controversy. He has tattoos. He has a cousin who is known as Lil Ominous. <laughs> That's a little ominous. It is. So here's some songs from our mystery Lil. Okay. Racks on Racks, Iced Out, mm-hmm. Next Back, not Neck. Any, Next Back, okay. N-E-X-T, Back. <laughs> now I've I'm, done, just, I'm just thinking about what these words mean. Yeah. I have no idea. Now, speaking of that, I'm going to pronounce this the best I can. Flex like owl. The what word, did you, are you okay? Did you just pull your rib have. cage or the something? Word, it, the word <laughs> flex like, and then it's O-U-U. Okay. Flex Owl. All right. So I already, I just, I'm not going to stop you. This has got to be one of those mumble rappers when you said minimalistic style and all this stuff. So I feel like I'm homing in on a potential okay. here. And, and I got two more facts right, for bring you. bring it. Had a song with our next president, Kanye oh, West. Kanye. 2024 is president. Oh, Let me clarify. Oh, oh, I was going another way, but now okay. this is bad. If I know it, are you really going to lose respect for me? Oh, definitely. <laughs> and had a song called I Love It with President Kanye West. Yeah. My last fact, um, this Lil endorsed the campaign of President Donald Trump in the 2020 mm-hmm. presidential election. Yep. Made posts on social media wearing the MAGA hat and was also brought out to a rally. Mm-hmm. So now it's time for you to name that Lil. So you got three okay. options. So um, would you? Do you I, want, I know who it is. Do oh you my want, gosh. Do you want me to? I first I thought it was going to be Lil's. Well, do you? Should I tell? I know who it is. I, I'm shocked that I know who this is. Yeah. But I thought it was going to be Lil Xan. Okay. Okay. Because you, and and you have three choice. Was Lil Xan on the list? Lil Xan. What is one of the choices? Okay. <laughs> This is bad. This is horrible. Um, I did not know. I'd never heard of any of those songs. Mm-hmm. Okay. When you said he did something with President Kanye, mm-hmm. I then realized it has to be a little pump. And you are correct. Okay. So I remember him going to the rally. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. I would not. So in my defense, I feel yeah. like I, I don't should, feel like a winner right now. You I, should not. In my defense, that song he did with Kanye mm-hmm. was pretty popular. Okay. And I do like Kanye West. So... I'm going to say I I knew it. What was the third one? So the three options I was going to give yeah. you were Lil Boozy. Okay. I've never heard of that one. Is that a real one? or is that He is. Okay. And the fact I have about him, he's a uh, rapper who has eight children with six women. Um, and, and, <laughs> that little, narrows it down. and Lil Xan, yeah. a rapper whose name is short for Lil Xanax. Right. And you had said Xanax. And I don't know why I know who Lil Xan is. I don't know yeah. any of his songs. I think yeah. it's just such a preposterous name that I that I know it. But um, well, I, listen, man, you're going to have to just really dig harder and yeah. find even more obscure Lils. But this has been yeah a blast. And this is the first episode of Name That Lil. All right. Well, that was fun, Steve. Thank you. I, it's man. It's always been my uh, dream to be on a game show about rappers. Um, yeah. And I feel like I kind of nailed it, but I do feel dirty. Mm-hmm. Or if you were in Germany, <laughs> Wurkan, Durkan. Yeah. yeah. 
in America, you're a little, yeah. little pump. In Soviet Russia... Little pump you? Yeah, I don't, I that doesn't who, really work. Who knows? I did read there's like there are rules to the construction. You wouldn't think it'd be that hard, but I just messed it up. So Well, maybe one day we'll play mm-hmm. Name That Lil with Yakov Smirnov. Oh that can gosh. be like a stretch goal for, for this year. I want to do that. So um, before we bring on... <laughs> A transition from Lil Wayne yeah. to like a distinguished uh, constitutional yeah. attorney. And he's going to love listening to this episode as yeah. he gets ready to hear his interview to We're see gonna, how it played out. I know. We're going instru- to instruct him to go right to the, um, to yeah. skip over this part. But uh, before we do get to uh, Mr. John Whitehead, let's just wrap up Big Brother. And, and I want to talk about what's kind of the long-term impact of this phrase. Is it relevant now? Why is it relevant now? We already hit on a lot of this. You know, we live in a world now of things like facial recognition. Like you said, our phones are listening to us, tracking us. The government is monitoring us. I mean, that's just a fact. It's sometimes yeah. it's hard to wrap your head around it. You hear that and we kind of say, yeah, hey, yeah, the government's monitoring us. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Let me turn my show on. Right. It is weird. It's, it's, I don't like it. Yeah. Um, but what am I going to do about it? Uh, our identities are constantly at risk of being stolen. This came out of, of China. This article was just two days ago. Facial recognition and beyond. Journalist ventures into China's surveillance state. I just want to hit a, a couple quick quotes from this article. By the way, this is written by uh, Dave Davies, and this is from NPR.org. Um, according to this article, in 2018, the People's Daily... Mm. which sounds like something right out of 1984. Yeah. The media mouthpiece of Chinese ruling Communist Party claimed on Twitter, to bring it to Twitter, so so freaking yeah. China. I said that like Trump, didn't I? China. Freaking China on Twitter claimed that the country's facial recognition system was capable of scanning the faces of China's 1.4 billion citizens in just one second. Hmm. I I don't I mean that can't be right. Well, see, see, I always think about China as sort of there's this thing with technology, right? Which we, it came up a lot in the '90s with like cloning, right? Where it was mm-hmm. like, is it ethical to do? And I always thought, well, we're asking that question, but China isn't. Right. China doesn't care if right. they can do it. If they can get the technology, yeah, they can get away with it. They'll do it. They're going to do it. And I think that's why we do need to keep an eye on this. And I'm actually interested in this book by Kai Strittmatter. It's called We Have Been Harmonized, and it's life in China's surveillance state. But just just the fact, um, he said, hey, it doesn't matter if it's true or not. This whole, they can scan everyone in the country's face Mm -hmm. in one second. It says it doesn't even matter whether it's true or not as long as people believe it. Right. And that's what the Communist Party is is all about. And that's what they're doing with all this high-tech surveillance technology is they're trying to internalize control. Once you believe it's true, Mm -hmm. it's like you you don't even need the policeman at the corner anymore. Right. And that's Big Brother. You know, you, you think he's watching you, even if he's not. You're reminded of it in constant, what it does to you when you think you're being watched and how you change your actions and behavior. And I think it's one of the scary things going on right now, with just the group think with the cancel culture that's out there. If you have to, to watch, you know, you have to watch what you say and not that you would say something that is patently agreed upon as vulgar or inappropriate, but... You know, the the coding for words seems to change by the day. And there's yeah. this fear of you say the wrong thing in front of the wrong person. And it's, it's yeah. and it, it changes the way people live. And it feels like we've sort of, as a society, let let this kind of happen slowly. Like the, you know, a frog getting boiled in it. Right. Where we, uh, we've talked about this a little bit in, I think it was in cancel culture, mm-hmm. where we talked about how, there was call out culture that came first. It was the nineties. Oh, you can't use this term. We're going to switch it to this term. Right. So somebody's trying to control the language. Right. The meaning hasn't really changed, mm-hmm. but we're going to, you got to use this word now. Right. And now you got to use this pronoun. And if you don't, mm-hmm. we're coming after you. You're going to call you out. And it's, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, what do we do to stop that? And I think it's the, the fact is we got to acknowledge the power that language has and not to trivialize when people fight back against the, the change of definitions and words. Yeah. Language is power. I think this book shows that also. Absolutely. Um, not only the power of surveillance, but the power of words. It was one of the reasons we do this show. Yes. Is we actually believe in the power of words and yes. the history of words, but words, words matter. Yeah. Yeah. We want to, I mean, this is a light podcast, but I mean, one of the things we do get excited about and one of the reasons why we love Barry Popick is because I think we're inspired by this guy 
cares about the meaning of words and, yeah. and, and the origins of words. And so do we. And, and that's one thing. And Steve, thank you for saying that because I forgot to mention the, the idea of new speak, which is also mm -hmm. in 1984, where the party basically is like, these are the rules. These are the, these are the words you use and what they mean. Right. And these old words, they, they call it old speak. Yeah. It's essentially the words of America in not the 1940s. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't use those anymore. Yeah. Um, and that's terrifying because that is happening now. Yeah. So, um, so now what we're going to do is we are going to bring on uh, Mr. John W. Whitehead and talk to him about the surveillance state that we're in. And he's going to answer some of our questions. So with no further delay, here's our conversation with John W. Whitehead. Our guest today is John W. Whitehead. John is an attorney who specializes in constitutional law and civil liberties. He's the founder of the Rutherford Institute and the author of more than 30 books on various legal and social issues. His most recent book is the best-selling Battlefield America, The War on the American People. John, thank you for joining us today. Hey, thank you for having me on the program, sir. Absolutely. So can you give us a little background on yourself and the work that you're doing with the Rutherford Institute? Yeah, I uh, founded the Rutherford Institute in 1982. I was a young lawyer. Uh, and we, what we do is I raise money to help people get in the courtroom against the government generally. And uh, they don't, you know, most people don't have the legal fees. And if you go to our website at rutherford.org, I write a weekly commentary, which we'll be talking about some of the commentaries today. I've written over 30 books now, mainly all deal, dealing essentially with, uh, in some way, with civil liberties and freedoms and how I think people should be acting in a world today that is growing increase, increasingly authoritarian. Um, you go to our website at rutherford.org, you'll see, sign up for our weekly uh, commentaries and all the stuff that we put out. And the thing that I want to do is not only help people legally, but educate people, get people really understanding what's going on today, how it's going to affect them. And uh, hopefully, chart some course to change where we're headed because we're headed toward a totally totalitarian regime, which will, and again, if you read books like 1984, George Orwell, who saw these things coming and um, most people will not realize what's happening to them and they'll, yeah. they'll just be half asleep. They'll be smiling and love big brother. And uh, that's basically, I think where we're headed. I'm seeing it more and more with the screen devices. Yes. Yeah, you know, I just read um, 1984 actually for the first time. I don't don't know how I how I missed it, and it really felt like wow. It, it was like an indictment. I was like, everyone should have, and Steve and I were talking. Everyone should have to read this book every couple years because it really is so so relevant. Um, so in your article, Big Brother wow. in Disguise: The Rise of a New Technological World Order, you write about how people can go hours online where the only human contact is virtual. I'm curious, you know, how you think that his uh, that phenomenon has been impacted during the quarantine. I assume it's made it worse. Yeah. Well, it's like Bill Gates said. He said, what do you need schools for if you have virtual education? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I heard that. I went, whoa, wait a second here. Uh, virtual education is eventually going to be, and it is to a large, large extent, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go back and study the history of how all these things came about, Usually mechanics like a car, the wheels on a car are actually feet moving quickly. That's basically how it's uh, talk, talked about and was studied uh, and all the things that we see. They use, technology used to be an extension of us. The problem we're seeing coming now is we're going to become the extensions of technology. Humanity is going to, in my opinion, basically be wiped away eventually if something is not done. And I'm not sure something can be done with the way it's moving because all your big corporations like Google – Google has their Singularity program where they're saying that by, by 2029, 2030, for some reason, too, if you're looking around today, 2030 is the magic word for everything. Mm -hmm. hey, 2030, things are going to be reset. 2030 this, 2030 that, if you read about all about it. Uh, it's called Singularity. The human mind is going to completely fuse with the Internet. Uh, you have uh, – Elon Musk now Neuralink, which right. is a chip you put in your head and your brain and your you know will actually fuse with a computer and that will be it. So what we're, what we're going to enter into, in my opinion, is a world of total virtual reality, and that's mm -hmm. where we're headed. And people will not know most of the time what they're hearing. A big problem with all that is, and I keep warning people, 
is that Amazon, Google, IBM, all your major corporations now uh, work with the Pentagon, the NSA, and the CIA in developing and maintaining their intelligence clouds for the 17 intelligence agencies, CIA, FBI, you go down the list, NSA. So they're working with these corporation, I mean, with these so-called government bodies, <clears throat> and they have access to all this information. So yeah. they have access to all the information that the government have. Yeah. What we're seeing is what in China, they have social credit scores where you can't fly, you can't do this. They'll pick you up off the street and arrest you if your social credit score. And that's for people who talk back, say the wrong word, this or that. All that's coming already in America. You've seen it with now with all these things being canceled off of the internet. It's coming, folks. Not only is it coming, it's here. Yeah, and it, it was a question I had too about what's more, what should be we be more scared of with all this technology, the government or corporations? But I guess the really scary thing is that they're they're hand hand in hand, right? They're fused. Yeah. We're in a corporate state now. It's what uh, Mussolini back in who was the, one of the first fascists called corporatism. He loved it. And so we're moving into a sort of a fascistic regime, in my opinion, where if you say the wrong word, do the wrong thing, you can get arrested. Listen, most people, and again, nobody's up on these facts. Over 80,000 SWAT team raids occurring in this country on an annual basis, up from 3,000 in the 1980s, where five to 500 dogs a day are getting shot, What this and that. People are getting shot. Kids are getting killed. And many, much of this is, Big stuff that the police are picking up over social media. They're studying all social media accounts. They're getting information. They're moving into predictive programming. I think you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where we're moving. We're moved into predictive programming now where they're trying to predict a crime. And what is that? That's minority report. I was going to say, that's some Philip K. Dick. Yep. Right K. There. Dick who yeah. was a genius, by the way, and saw all this coming. Yeah. Uh, if you read Philip K. Dick's work, his exegesis, all the things he wrote, what he was saying was, we're moving into a total robot government. And he was saying that in the late 1970s. Yeah. So that's basically where we're at today. And uh, what happens, people say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, listen, do robots have empathy? They see someone hungry on the street. Is the robot going to go, oh, I'll go get him. I will go get him a cup of tea. <laughs> I will get him a hamburger. Right. No, no, they're not. And that's the way we're going to think more and more and the way we're going to look at one another as yeah. something without a soul. And that's where we're headed. We're, we're becoming things without souls and spirits. We're becoming an extension of artificial intelligence. And that's exactly where Eric Schmidt and Google, all the big shots, are on. they want that because they, they can control you that way. You say the wrong word. Like you, something happens, you kick your foot. Oh, darn. Oh, shoot. Right. They can get you canceled off the internet. They can get a policeman knocking at your door. Well, yeah, and you've seen that. It's not right, and that's not some sort of conspiracy theory. That, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so it's glad you joined fact. us. What's that? It's all a fact. Yeah, it, it's. And you mentioned social media. So, are you saying that people, as they use social media, have to be careful because it's being monitored and can be used against you by law enforcement? That's something yeah. you've seen happen. Police departments. Listen, the FBI, most people realize this, like the best of your large cities and some of your small cities, the FBI actually has offices in the police departments. They help direct all this. They watch all your social media accounts. They have real-time crime centers. Have you heard of them? No. The fusion centers. There's, sprinkled, there's at least over 70 fusion centers across the country. Mm. There are large facilities of TV screens. The military, Department of Homeland Security help run them with the local police. They watch everything you're doing. License plate readers, for example. Mm -hmm. If you're out driving, they, they actually, the drones, by the way, in the sky, wherever they're doing, the police will have a license plate readers on their cars. Uh, they read where you're, what, what your license plate is, who you are, and where you're going. If you're going to a protest rally, for example, one that says don't fund the police or whatever they're saying, defund the police or whatever they're doing, uh, they'll be watching you. They'll know what you're doing. When they come to your door, some people say, why are the police so agitated when they came to my door? Because they're watching your social media account. They know exactly what you're thinking. Right. You say, I don't like cops or whatever. Mm -hmm. Again, this is America, folks. You have a right to say, I don't like cops. I don't like the president. I don't like the vice president. I don't like the mayor. I think he sucks. Mm -hmm. That is called freedom of speech. But they don't want freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. They don't want you to think. And that's why you see all this internet stuff moving so quickly is that 
And people aren't going to think, like I say, when I go into restaurants and see families not even talking to one another anymore, they're getting their information from Google. They're getting it from Facebook. I mean, and Facebook and all those groups work with the government. So we, we've moved into a corporate state. So what I'm saying is <clears throat> there's no distinguishing all this stuff we're seeing, all this peeping on us, all this surveillance. We're in a total surveillance state. Yeah. Well, we're going to, I'm going to ask you in a minute, what are some things that people can do to maybe help with this, but maybe we'll freak ourselves out a little bit more first. Um, you wrote in your article, the same article I referred to earlier about the internet of senses. And I've actually never even heard that term before. Can you tell us what that means and talk about that a little bit? Yeah. What they develop and it's actually working. I mean, they can pipe. I mean, once you move into the brain chip interface, which is going to be, become popular, I think I've, I've talked to people who are willing to go ahead and do it, have a chip put in their head. Wow. So they can actually fuse. They'll be able to, you know, uh, let's say you're eating a, a salad. They say, well, they, and you want to eat a steak. They can actually pump that into your head and you think you're eating a steak. That's actually happened. They can pump music into your head. Uh, they can pump sounds. Uh, it's what they're calling merged reality. And it's a virtual reality world. It's the internet of senses. And uh, if you've seen the movie Matrix, yes. you have virtual reality glasses you can wear. And you have to say, um, no, you don't have to say it, just think it. I'd like to go to so-and-so, wherever you're at, the town. It'll boop, 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 go wrap on the screen immediately. And mm -hmm. all you have to do is think it. And uh, – so that's where everything's headed. By 2030, all that's going to be in place. And my opinion is it's going to be in place before 2030. Uh, I mean, the brain ch chip interface is already there. Singularity is moving faster than 2029 where it's going. So it's already there. And right. they're going to be able to, to basically, I mean, listen, the Internet of Things, you know, 127 million objects are already connected to the Internet. I mean, from your... Yeah. Your Amazon doorbell, by the way, it watches everybody. The Alexa speakers in your home, they listen to everything you say. And they and, and it, listen, wait a second here. Amazon works with the NSA, CIA, and you're actually telling them what you're saying in your home. I mean, Orwell, he, said, he thought the screen devices would be the ultimate listening devices. He didn't get the idea. <laughs> if he saw Amazon, he'd be going, whoa. Yeah. I think you would be surprised too that we all voluntarily purchase our own listening devices to keep keep bias at all times. I'm really surprised. If you read the book, I mean you just recently read the book at the end. What did Winston Smith do? He loved Big Brother. Yeah. 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 It's all roads. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's what you know, uh, I love Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam is watching me. Big brother may be watching you. And uh, that's what it is today. Uncle Sam is watching us. And whoever they are, whoever the president, you know, as long as you love the ruler and that's what they want you to do. But I would look at people. Why do you want to be ruled? Why do you want somebody telling you what you do, what to think? And mm -hmm. the human mind's very, very, very um, lazy. But listen, go back in time uh, from Rome to Greece, Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. Italy, Soviet Union. Read about the Soviet Union, which is a place that, I mean, most people don't know we're, we're copying a lot of the old Soviet Union stuff. That we're putting people in psychiatric hospitals. They're saying their own thing on websites, you know. Right. Uh, and again, it's called civil commitment. They're locking up 1.5 million a year in America for people saying the wrong thing here or there, and the police show up and put them in hospitals, and they can't get out. I mean, we actually help some people get out of those hospitals. Mm -hmm. But that's the old Soviet Union. But that's uh, – it, there, there's something in our DNA that we have to correct, and you have to override it. You can override your DNA, but what well, is it? How you go? Free speech is one key thing. Mm -hmm. Getting together with people, debating, talking, causing your brain to think. Most people don't want to think. That's why they don't like free speech. They, they want to get rid of political correctness today. They're telling kids they have a list of words kids can't say these days. Mm -hmm. I had kids tell me there was 10 words I couldn't say. One of them was the G word. And I said, oh, the God word in public schools is not good. Was nothing. Right. I said, well, where, where is it? Can you spell it? The student spelled G-U-N-S. Uh, and I went, yeah. oh, I get it. So what do you say about the, those people over in uh, those American soldiers in Iraq? What are they carrying? Right. Carrying G's? They called them G's. Wow. Yeah. What are the cops carrying? The police? <laughs> are those yeah. G's? Yeah. Uh, you start looking incredibly stupid. Yeah. 
Speaking of saying wrong things on a website and having the chance to debate, um, since we record our initial episode, one of the reasons we sped up our interview with you is, you know, we've seen uh, the president being banned from Twitter and Facebook, and then following that, uh, Google and Amazon and one other, the Apple, Apple mm -hmm. going after Parler and basically removing them from having the chance to be functional anywhere. If you could share a little bit of your thoughts on the interconnectedness of the big tech companies and your thoughts on, you know, what's happened in the last few days specifically with, with seem in my impression, seeming to target one organization. Oh yeah. Like I said, uh, IBM, Microsoft, Google, Amazon all work together with the government. They do. They have contracts, tens of billions of dollars to work with their intelligence clouds. So you're not working with this one little group. You're working with a big group. And like I say, more free speech is better than less free speech. Uh, more free speech makes people think. They don't want you to think. That's the key. They want you to buy. It's all about money. That's all the government wants is your money. They want your tax money. Working with the corporate entities, they want you to be locked in your home. And they can feed you whatever they want to feed you or send you whatever they want to send you. And virtual reality. So that's exactly what's happening to us right now. And, it, you know, it's something that it's going to be very, very difficult to get out of. But, you know, blocking what anybody says. I, listen, listen, I want to know what the president's saying, whether it's nutty, right. not nutty, insane. I want to know. I don't want him being – or. She being blocked from what they're saying. Let them, let them speak. Let us hear. I mean, are you saying that I'm so stupid <laughs> that I can't listen to what they're saying? And that's exactly what they're saying. We're going to block it so you can't hear it because it might cite you to do something. Like what? Think? <laughs> yeah. And that's it. They don't want you to think. And that's why I'm against all censorship. I'm sorry, especially from politicians. Let the politicians blab. Let them talk. We should be hearing what they say. We voted for them. Well, whatever you voted for them, put them in office. We, we need to know what they're thinking. If they're going nuts, I need to know they're going nuts. I don't need them hidden from me, by the way. But they want to block that from you. They want you relaxed. They want to feed you information. They want to sell you products. And then they want you to be controlled. Right, right. It was an end. It's control. Yeah. And like I say, with the corporate state has fused now, it's control. And they're controlling people. Yeah. And the sort of the hard part to tackle, I think, well, the, a lot of it's hard, but is the point you made earlier that it people almost don't want to think it seems like. And and what is that about us uh, that we want to sort of fall in with? OK, you know, in 1984, there's there's new speak. Right. And the words change. And it's like there's this urge to want to please whoever it is, you know, and use the right words because you don't want to get called out. Right. That's this crazy the dynamic that seems to be getting worse and worse. Is there any way that that's going to the ball's going to start rolling the other way? You know, it seems like we're so far down. Like, uh, let me let me tee it up this way. I listened to the last episode of your podcast, um, Freedom Under Fire, which is available on Apple Podcasts and other outlets. And you talked about the outlook for 2021. And it was mostly kind of grim. You know, as I'm listening, I'm going, oh, man, I can't argue with any of this, but it's kind of depressing. But you said um, if there was any hope to be found that it would come it would come down to us and not politicians. And I'm curious what advice you have for our listeners. Um, how can we change for things for the better and start to maybe turn the tide the other way? Is it possible, do you think? Well, listen, uh, <clears throat> I flew in and out of Washington, D.C. for 40 years. It's the most corrupt place I've ever been in my life in terms of money, greed, uh, I mean, uh, there's a recent study, two years old, at SM University, that studied psychopathology, and we're basically it congregated in the United States. It went state by state. They came in the District of Columbia. Is where it's, uh, so we're basically run by psychopaths. What are psychopaths? People who don't have any empathy. They're there just for themselves. They can be very charismatic and dance around and get large followers of people and all those kind of things. And... Uh, also, another study was done where, where uh, basically uh, money congregated in the United States and the billionaires. It was Washington, D.C. again. That was Northwestern University with Princeton University. And they came to the conclusion the professors were run by 585 billionaires. And again, during this 
whole COVID thing, the billionaires, Bezos, you go down, Zuckerberg, they've made billions. They're, they've made more money. As the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. That's the corporate state. There's only one thing that people can do in this country. And it, if you go back and study the history of this country, the early fighters were local fighters. There were people who went down to the city council, their local governments, and took them over and said, we're going to protest. We're going to surround the building. Nonviolent, by the way. That was the key. Mm -hmm. Nonviolent protest. And the guy who was really adept at this was Martin Luther King, who, by the way, got in a lot of trouble, got a bullet through the head for some of his activity, in my opinion. And his family believes the same thing. But local governments can, under the 10th Amendment, if people know their constitution and the average citizen has no idea what's in the Bill of Rights, is the 10th Amendment says that local governments can nullify acts of the federal government. You can do it. Get together in your state and local communities together. I'm saying, telling people start civil liberties committees in your local community. Get on the phone. Watch what your government's doing because listen to this. A lot of governmental bodies are controlled by corporate interests who come in when they get elected, start taking them to dinner, flying right. them to places so they can get their stuff in. And as we're seeing what's happening with 110,000 restaurants closing down, they're saying now within the next year, all the corporate interests and big stores are going to move in and take over even local communities. So get ready. You're going to see, all you're going to see is whatever big bro who works with the government is going to yeah. be pushing down your throat. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's moving. So the only hope is in the each individual. And again, I'll go back and say, again, we, we, we mentioned it earlier, People have a tendency to just say, oh, he, he's a good one. I voted for him. And I right. say the voting is the least thing you can do. Mm -hmm. Voting is saying, we want you pointing in the right direction, mister. And then if they don't do it, you start going after them. You start organizing protests. You go down and run for your office. Mm -hmm. Set up these civil liberties oversight committees in your community and local government. Washington, D.C. is not going to listen. They will listen to an uprising out there that is coordinated, nonviolent, and follow John Lennon's device, uh, advice. He said the government wants to tweak your beard and punch you in, in the chest to get you violent. That way they got you. What the government can handle, the two things is nonviolence and humor. Go back against government with nonviolence. And Martin Luther King was really good at that. And uh, if it wasn't for him, a lot of things were uh, the Civil Rights Act, all the things that he got passed. Mm -hmm. But he was so well organized that in his last days, he was planning on basically with nonviolent sit ins shutting Washington, D.C. down. He said, They're not going to listen to me. He wrote articles on it. Before he could do that, he got killed. Mm -hmm. So, but there are. And again, we write about these things on our website, how to do these things. And in my last book, Battlefield America, I go into it really clearly. It's time for the local people to act, push back this laziness in your DNA, get up and get active. And here you have to, the average American watches 150 hours of television a month. I say give freedom one third of those hours or one half of those hours. Yeah. And get active in your local community. Well, that's great advice. And I think it's going to take people being bold and, and sort of being okay with maybe a little bit of ostracism or exposing themselves uh, to being canceled or, you know, if you will, cancel culture, oh, yeah. because that everything you're saying makes sense. But because of the way things are now, if you say, Hey, I'm going to go do this because what you just said, I think now people are afraid they're going to lose their jobs, you know, cause they say, Oh, well, you're part of this freedom coalition thing. What is that? It sounds, right. I don't know if I, if I, you know, it sounds too radical or maybe it's, it, they start calling you some like neocon or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, you got to be, be willing to stand up to that. And I think that might be one of the hurdles that we have. Yeah. And again, nonviolence works. You get violent and all of a yeah. sudden things change. We saw that. <laughs> you get violent and stupid. If yeah. you coordinated and nonviolent, you can change things because that, like I said, I think Lennon and all those great thinkers of that age understood it. Uh, they have trouble handling that. They want that. Why do you have a militarized police now around the country when they want to? I mean, they didn't do it. Upon, when they want to, they can smash anything. Uh, and once you go up against that foe in some places, you're going to get a lot of trouble and you're going to get a lot of people, you know, in your community saying 
you're a rebel or out, but you know, it's like Orwell said, you don't even come conscious. This is a quote from George Orwell until you rebel. Mm. Your brain thinks. I like that. Most people, and here's the other thing in the public schools today, they're not teaching kids to think. Mm. They don't, they, 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 words are banned. They're pushing certain agendas. Yeah. And the kids coming out of school today, that, listen, I talked to lawyers who just graduated from law school. They can't tell me what's in the Bill of Rights. It's only 462 words. Wow. They're not teaching the Bill of Rights in the schools or the Declaration of Independence. If you read the, Decor- the intro of the Declaration of Independence, says you can throw the tyrants out. They don't yeah. want that. But you can throw the tyrants out, folks. We've seen it. It wouldn't be on in America if it wasn't for people who thought like that. Yeah. Mr. Whitehead, thank you so much for your time. This has been awesome. Um, I guess the last question I have for you is, you know, we asked what can people do to help uh, with, you know, turning the tide and sort of the thought police state that we find ourselves in today. But I wanted to ask about technology um, and you've talked a lot about the the pervasiveness of the surveillance and, and everything. And just by reading your articles in, in Battlefield America, there's so much that you can learn about what's going on right now. How can people, is there anything that people can do to try to protect themselves from this invasive technology? I mean, I guess unplugging in some way, or is there any advice you have there? Or do we just succumb to it? Hey, we're, we're in 1984, <laughs> Big Brother's watching. Well, we're in 1984. Big Brother is definitely watching. And uh, it's, uh, I'm going to say, we, we're, we've been advocating electronic bill of rights that would be good to get federal government to issue that. We need an immediate appeal system when people are so called taken off of the internet or whatever. We need that. That needs to be set up and they need, they need to be protected because they can destroy people's lives now. Uh, we're going to be advocating that more and trying to get some lawmakers involved in that and hopefully setting up a system where they just can't cancel you and they're canceling people. We know I've seen a number of them done that treated that way. And so, I mean, we're starting there, but listen, yeah. getting the average American to move their eyes up off those screens is so darn difficult. And yeah. Yeah. I'm afraid we may have to crash before we see. It's like a lot of people, you're walking along the street until you bang into that pole and bang your head. Oh, okay, maybe I should put this in my yeah. pocket. Yeah. Or when I'm, walk, when I'm driving and I see people crossing the street with reading a cell phone, I'm going, only an idiot would do that. Yeah. And that's where we're at. So, well, and we have, again, programs like yours are good. We just need to keep speaking out and telling people, reduce your screen time and use physical time and get out in your communities. Well, hopefully it's just a pole and not a car uh, that we get hit by, because I think you're right there. Um, People can go to Rutherford.org and sign up for email alerts. Um, Make sure you check out Battlefield America, um, as well as uh, Freedom Under Fire, um, Mr. Whitehead's podcast. John, thank you so much for joining us. This has been enlightening, and we'll keep our eyes on what you're up to uh, as well. And again, thanks for being a guest today. Thank you, guys. Good job. Thank you very much for listening to Origin of Species. If you enjoyed this episode and want to have some more content, including exclusive podcasts like Personal Records and True Facts with Robert Van Kett, plus our video podcast, The Post Game Show, become a Speaksies supporter at patreon.com slash Speaksies. Your support of any amount allows you access to all content um, and your funds go to help us maintain our show and potentially grow it. Thank you again for listening to Origin of Species. Bob's your uncle. Watch out for bears and kale is from the devil. Speaksies.